those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Brown. Um, I'm the moderator for today's webinar. I serve currently as Eden's treasurer, and my day job is director of the National Institute for Digital Learning based at Dublin City University in Ireland. This is the third webinar in our current Eden webinar series under the umbrella theme of Time for Action, Shaping Higher Education 4.0. We've had a few questions of what we mean by higher ed education 4.0, and it's a little bit of a play on industry 4.0. We can debate whether, in fact, there is such a thing as higher education or just education 4.0 more generally, but that's perhaps for another day because the particular topic we're going to be focusing on today is teaching after the storm, reimagining the traditional lecture. Before I say um, more about the topic and introduce today's panel, um, just for those of you who have just arrived, um, and I see the numbers are still going up, a couple of housekeeping things, please do introduce yourself in the chat, post comments and so on. Uh, note that today's webinar is being recorded, so it will be available if you have to leave. We appreciate sometimes it's hard to be able to be uh, attending the whole session, so that will be available within days of the webinar. And I think that's probably everything you need to know, other than one last thing is Eden as Europe's, um, one of Europe's leading professional bodies in supporting open online e-learning, distance learning, um, is celebrating its 30th year this year. And um, I should flag to you that our annual conference is in June. It's being hosted in Madrid, but it's obviously virtual online. So there's a little advertisement for you to check that out. We'll put a link in the chat box. Um, there's still even an opportunity probably to contribute in one way or another. So without further ado, I'm just conscious of time. Um, let me introduce today's panel to you. I'm actually going to give them a chance to say a little bit about themselves. I don't like reading too much of their bios because that's too much of me and a bit boring hearing it from me. It's much better, I think, to hear it in the flesh from our panel members. So I'm delighted, firstly, to introduce my colleague from Dublin City University and the Institute of Education, and that's Anne-Marie Farrell. So welcome, Anne-Marie. Thank you. Secondly, today we have um, all the way from Carlton University in Canada, where I think it's still relatively early in the morning, if I'm correct, I'm pleased to welcome David um, Hornsby, and we'll hear from David shortly. Uh, next, uh, and this is in no particular order for the panel, because I think we're going to mix this up over the course of the discussion, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Valencia DJ, DJ, if I might have not well, thought that right. <laughs> Thank you. From the University of Zagreb. Um, she has a very distinguished career having, uh, I think we might hear a little more about this, having been the Croatian Minister for Science and Education. Um, so we're pleased to have you here with us. And then finally, delighted to welcome a good colleague from the University of South Africa, Dr. Paul um, Prinslow. Paul's also an Eden Fellow, so he's a very good uh, friend of Eden, and we're pleased to have you here um, to make up the uh, Canadian and South African contingent, you could say even a bit of a Southern Hemisphere contingent, because those of you who don't know my background, I'm originally from New Zealand. So we can say we're covering the whole world. Um, at this stage, perhaps I'll ask Anne-Marie just to say a little bit about your background so people know where you're coming from and your particular interests. Okay. Uh, so uh, as Mark said, my name is Anne-Marie and I work in Dublin City University. Um, I originally trained as a primary school teacher and then I worked at primary level for a number of years, then at post-primary level here in Ireland. And I also worked in special schools. So I had, a, I had a fair bit of background in terms of teaching and learning in those contexts. And I moved into higher education 20 years ago this September, working initially, I work in teacher education um, and have done for the last 20 years, originally in a college of education and now over since the last four years, uh, we were incorporated into um, a university context. And Mark asked me to mention something that maybe wouldn't necessarily uh, be findable online or on my bio. So uh, my revelation is that uh, I'm a bit of a dab hand at ballroom dancing. Um, I can do uh, quite a good um, 
uh, jive, rock and roll, uh, waltz and a few things like that. Unfortunately, Irish men aren't great at dancing. So uh, that's that's a bit of a challenge, but that's my that's my claim to fame. Well, thanks very much, Anne-Marie, for that. Your secret is safe with me because yeah, I'm, yeah. Dancer, so <laughs> I'm not going to expose that to my colleagues or your colleagues. Let's go with the same order that we were talking. So um, next up, uh, Valencia. Um, so um, I think that it is a pronunciation is always a problem when we uh, when you have to pronounce Croatian names. So my name is Blazenka, but thank you, Mark, for introduction. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, let me greet all of you panelists and uh, uh, participants, especially because I'm uh, really proud because I can see a lot of uh, people from Croatia in chat uh, sending. Uh, greetings, that's good. I, I really love it because it, I think it's a great topic uh, that we are going to uh, discuss today. Uh, so um, I'm a professor at the University of Zagreb, Faculty of Organization and Informatics. Uh, my PhD is in mathematics. So at the beginning, I developed a new geometry, uh, so-called pseudo-Galilean uh, geometry. But um, I'm not going to talk about it uh, today. Don't be afraid. Um, and but I work quite a lot about um, uh, on the topic of education, strategic planning um, in education, uh, high education decision making, but also e-learning, um, all sorts of learning analytics. Because I'm a mathematician, so it's rather close to me. And as Mark said, I was um, um, a Minister of Science and Education. Um, I just um, finished my, my term a couple of uh, months ago, and now I'm back at the university. And I'm um, really enjoying my time back uh, research and uh, teaching. I'm also teaching um, uh, large classes. Uh, I have uh, classes that are uh, larger than um, 300 students. So I'm experienced in that uh, that area. In the meantime, when I have time, I really love watching cr uh, some crime uh, series on TV because it relaxes me, and it is um, uh, it, it's really something that I'm not so proud of. But during pandemics, it it is it's much more accessible than as Marie uh, and Marie said, dancing. So. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, Paul, we'll come to you now. Hi there, I'm Paul Prinsler. I'm a research professor in Open Business Learning. I'm situated in the Department of Business Management in the College of Economic and Management Sciences at UNISA. And maybe not everyone knows, but UNISA is the oldest business education provider in the world. We were founded in 1873. And currently we have about 380,000 students. Uh, with some of our courses having 14,000 students per semester. So, Blazinka, uh, 300 students sounds like heaven to me. One thing that uh, many people don't know about me, I used to run ultra marathons. Luckily, I stopped and I'm still alive. And I completed what they call the ultimate human race. It's a comrades marathon in South Africa. It is uh, only 89 kilometers long. And I managed to run it twice, and I'm still very proud of it. Thank you, Mark, and thanks for being here. Well, there you go, Paul. I didn't know that about you. So thanks for sharing that. And David. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mark, and, and greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is David Hornsby. I'm the Associate Vice President for Teaching and Learning at Carleton University. I'm also a Professor of International Affairs at the Norman Patterson School. Uh, so I like to play in different spaces, uh, and teaching and learning is where I'm working uh, at the moment. I have a particular passion for large class teaching, which actually got started, funny enough, in South Africa at Wits University, um, where Paul and I became Twitter buddies uh, very shortly after, I think, we both cottoned on to Twitter was a thing. Um, and, 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 and I noticed that there's a bunch of people here uh, logging on from South Africa, so a big, uh, a big how's it to everybody, and happy Africa Day. Um, one thing that people don't uh, know about me is that I'm actually, as well as a social scientist, also a published scientist, having uh, in an earlier incarnation of my career um, been able, had the fortune of working in a biomedical uh, sciences space on the hormone relaxin and, and its effects on, get this, testicular descent. So <laughs> from testicular descent to large class teaching, here we are. <laughs> 
Well, that's a, how can I capture, how can I beat that with it? My sort of uh, sharing something you may not know about me. Well, some of my closer colleagues know that uh, I'm colorblind. So I see the world slightly differently than others um, when I select to. But no, that's um, quite common in males, but quite rare in women. And my mother was colorblind. So women have the, the dominant gene. Folks, let's get our teeth into the, the discussion. I, I almost said debate. It might be a bit of a debate. We'll see how the panel, um, what perspective they take on. Our opening question, which is really, is the lecture dead? The traditional lecture dead? It's a bit provocative. Um, will you know the traditional lecture format be a casualty in the efforts to build back better, to sort of borrow some of the language that's used right now? It's certainly the case that one of the biggest challenges we faced when we had to quickly move to so-called emergency remote teaching was how to teach large classes effectively. Um, and there's been certainly a reasonable amount written, and I know Anne-Marie's published a report that we'll share with you on, on that very topic. So what we're really here to think about today is looking to the future and drawing on the experience and reflections over the last 12 months or more to see whether or not the lecture is going to be a format that we continue in, shall we say, Education 4.0. So to kick things off in that sort of um, response to the question, we do have a short poll. We don't want to take too long on this, but we are interested, and I know the panel is interested, in seeing what our participants think. So let me see if I can just launch this poll. It's one simple question for you. Um, hopefully you've got that up there now, I'll read it for those of you who might be a bit small, the text. Um, as we look to the future and attempt to design more engaging learning experiences for our students, I believe the traditional lecture is dead. It's deliberately written in the I language and in the affirmative. So let's see, we're seeing the responses coming through here. We'll share these shortly. Just give people a chance to engage in that simple poll. A few more seconds, maybe 10 seconds to give your ideas, your thoughts. And at the same time, by all means, put your response if you want to add a little more detail to why you answered in a certain way in the chat box. Okay, I'll close it off on that note um, and end the poll. And let's have a look at the results. You able to see those? Good, the panel's nodding. So actually, I think we've got a um, quite a split group, really, in response to what is a very, very forceful and black and white sort of question. So maybe it's not surprising most people, it seems, well, when I say most, we don't have a majority, but the largest response is in the not sure category. Um, but Perhaps that's a little bit more polled than I thought it would be in terms of the various options. And without any further ado, I'll stop sharing the poll. And, and Anne-Marie, I'm going to give you the first chance, since you're a DCU colleague, to see what your response is to the question. The floor is yours as such. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I think, uh, as you know, I'm a teacher in, in higher education. But uh, I'm also currently a student in higher education. I'm doing my doctorate in Sheffield University. And um, I think this is probably my fifth or sixth higher education course that I've become a student on over the last 35 years. Um, and across those years as a student, um, I, you know, in, in my very first undergraduate program, I would have called every single session I went to a lecture. Uh, regardless of size, what it was about, what the structure of it was, they were all lectures. Um, so I suppose one of the things when, when you ask a question like that is what do people understand by that word? Do they, do they believe it to be um, a word that, you know, infers that the teacher is talking at their students while the students sit passively in the class without uh, a two-way um, communication? Is it about those really big classes? Um, and if so, what, what do we mean or how do we quantify big? Or is it any class in higher education? Like, so, you know, people call me a lecturer, regardless of whether I have, you know, five people in a class or 450 in a class. So, so I think the word is a bit 
laden with beliefs and assumptions. And in terms of change after what's happened over the last few months, I wonder, is it more about how we can breathe life back into teaching? Like one of the things that that really seemed for me um, is is, uh, the centrality of teaching throughout this pandemic. It is it is what uh, certainly in my own university, huge resources were poured into supporting teaching, supporting students and so on. And that seems to have been replicated, even see it on social media in particular, uh, around my peers internationally, um, very much talking about their teaching and supporting that. So, so I think it's brought teaching back into the back to the center of higher education. I think I don't believe the, le- the, the, the large class, if that's what we're talking about, that large classes are dead. I don't think they can be, and I don't think they should be. Um, and the reason I don't think that is because I, from everything I've read, it is very different. There is no definition of what a large class is. And it seems to be more um, conceptualized around um, how the teacher engages with number or how they perceive numbers to be a challenge or not. And that's, I think, more to do with our own confidence and competence in teaching, regardless of the context. Um, And there, there are... I mean, one of the questions we might ask is, is, you know, can we quantify or define what a small class is or what manageable means in terms of teaching and learning um, as well? So from my perspective, I, I don't think they are dead. I don't think they should be dead. But I absolutely do think whether we are talking about very large numbers of students or classes of 30 or 40, I do think we need to and consider what teaching is in higher education and how that aligns, how teaching and learning align, regardless of the context. Well, thank you very much. And and you came out with a very clear answer to the questions uh, and then lots of interesting qualifiers and probing a little deeper. Who wants to go next in answering the question? Sure, go ahead. I might go uh, just free oh, short. Sorry, minutes. Paul. I think we oh. just had um, Balenza. Uh. So uh, thank you, thank you. I think that um, I'm going to be a little bit provocative because I think that um, yeah, if you are talking about large classes and teaching in a way uh, in a, this old school 19th century format, I hope it is that. So just one way street and delivery of content. I hope it is that, um, or even worse. Um, what we have right now, it is a modern version of reading uh, over uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, slides or something like that. It, I wish to be even more that than this old old stuff. So, um, so I agree with uh, Anne Marie that um, we should distinguish um, not between the, the numbers, but between the kind of how we are engaging students, how we are working with students, how we are preparing our lecture. Uh, are we going to use some uh, some tools to to engage students, but also to trigger uh, independent learning? Um, and uh, but um, if uh, to be honest, I think that large lecture is not going to to die because uh, for a very long time uh, universities are keeping them because um, they are very economic, um, cheap, but counts. So it means you you have uh, your lecturing, but it is it's really cheap, and very rarely there are uh, questioning about it. I think that uh, this pandemic is now um, really an opportunity that we ask these questions to un- analyze and um, uh, find another practices. So in in majority of cases, it is not uh, effect, uh, effective or engaging form of learning, uh, but it's very economic. So in that sense, I hope. We are going to change it, and um, it is one of the good things that we use this opportunity of pandemics to change it, to to introduce hybrid forms and to 
have a hybrid forms uh, um, using online tools as well as um, lecturing uh, in physical classes, but uh, to be um, to reimagine uh, this whole stuff about it. I, I couldn't help but have an image in my mind when you're talking about um, variations on how people lecture. I well recall, and I don't know if the panel have had this experience of someone standing for almost an hour and reading their notes to me. Um, no other visual aids, just reading. Uh, and I looked around the room as people were copying notes and I couldn't figure out why I would bother, to be honest, never did. Uh, I was one of the few that didn't take notes. But if that is the lecture, then I kind of have to say I, I come on the side or as one of the participants in the chat box has said, is the lecture alive, if that's what we're talking about. Paul, sorry I cut you off before. The floor is yours. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm sort of in between Anna Marie and Blazenka. Uh, three short remarks. My question is not whether the traditional lecture is dead. Uh, I'm asking, is it still alive? Um, so th that's the first remark. The second remark is, what do we mean when we speak about a traditional lecture? What do we refer to? Is it the monotonous reciting or reading from a page? Or do we refer to the format and the gravitas of the lectures given by Michel Foucault or Karen Barat or Judith Butler, which are powerful performances of word and intellect? If, if that is the traditional lecture that we're referring to, I hope it lives forever. But if we refer to the traditional lecture as death by PowerPoint, I hope it dies soon. So, uh, so when so I, I'm sort of in a double bind between what do we mean about the traditional lecture. My last comment is from my own context of a business education provider with 380,000 students. What is a traditional lecture in business education? In the context of of UNISA, the the learning materials or the resources is the outcome of a two year process of design production and delivery. So, so that's very much alive and should be alive. So, so the I would position to say that in that format, in distance education, the learning resources will be very much alive and even more alive than ever before. I'm questioning is if the lecture in distance education is alive in the terms of learning resources, is the learning and the pedagogy alive? And there I get back to Anne-Marie to say that even if the learning resources are there, well-designed quality, it does not mean learning will happen. So the focus, if I ask then in closing whether the lecture is it, I say maybe it is, but I, I'm more concerned is learning alive. Interesting. And, and I guess it just shows you how this question has so many different layers to it. When you first talked about double bind, that really resonated with me because uh, I have to be honest and say that I enjoy lecturing. Um, I say that in the sense that most of my teaching these days is probably more done behind the podium in a keynote address, but that is a dressed up lecture and the opportunity to perform, uh, if you like, on a stage. And at least I hope I'm self-critical to say, am I doing this for the participants or is it for me? Is it something that I feed off? And I certainly do feed off the energy in a room of that nature. But there is that performance dimension, which I'm not sure the learners, to pick up on your point, Paul, really actually need to support their learning. David, your floor is yours. Thank you. And and I really, you know, I don't, I would not in any way, shape or form disagree with anything that my fellow colleagues on the panel here have said. I think I absolutely agree with the nuance that is, that has emerged. And, you know, I would, I would also um, sort of concur saying that, you know, there are many positive attributes about the lecture, uh, the traditional lecture. And I think I think about it from the space of creating community and bringing people together and the opportunity to learn from each other. And within that context, there are particular attributes of the traditional lecture that I would like to see die, namely the talking at rather than talking with uh, type of mentality, the transference or assumption of, uh, of, of 
uh, students being empty vessels, participants being empty vessels, the transference of disciplinary content as opposed to trying to focus on student engagement. Those are some of the things that I would absolutely think that need to change or, or need to be, um, need, the traditional need, lecture needs to get rid of. But under this context of sort of the pandemic, you know, the big question for me is if we want, if we're really serious about this idea of the traditional lecture dying, um, what are we doing about it in our, in our universities and uh, in our sector? How are we modeling different ways forward? How are we placing and positioning pedagogy within the incentive structures of university environments to be taken seriously. And I think what this whole pandemic has shown is actually just how important uh, underpinning our teaching practice with good pedagogy, with good learning theory and understanding of it, uh, how important that is. And so for me, when we move forward with the, in, in the post pandemic world, um, it is gonna be about how do we continue on with some of these things? How do we continue on with the gains that we've made in terms of our, our collective understanding in universities around a good pedagogical practice? Because this, you know, you know, as much as the pandemic has been an awful and horrific uh, experience, the silver lining is everybody's been thinking and talking about pedagogy. And that's something that we simply have not had before. So if we want the traditional lecture to die, if we want good learning theory and practice to be forefronted, what are we gonna do about it going forward? How are we gonna structure our environments and our universities to reinforce those good practices? I think that's a, a great point there, David, about how if there's a legacy that we have been talking about teaching and learning about pedagogy, the mere fact even that this conversation is taking place um, albeit in the shadow of COVID. Um, so it really kind of raises for me the question then, what is it that we have learnt that we can take away in building back better? Um, whilst we're talking about the lecture here, I don't want to just focus too narrowly on that because it may be in light of your responses, there are other aspects that you want to bring into it. But the, the essential question is how can we apply the lessons we've had um, over the last year or more and build back better. Who would like to start off on that? Just jump straight in. Blazinka, you go first. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh, there are many, um, many lessons learned all wrong, but um, um, this systematic approach, I really like that Anne-Marie performed um, and um, uh, in this report, that we should gather it and uh, try to, to analyze it because it is not something that we can just, um, um, you know, uh, remember afterwards. We, we should um, have this action, action research right now because we have opportunity um, and to together to analyze all these practices and to understand also that online uh, lecture cannot just be a second uh, second rate copy of face to face and vice versa. So we should uh, try to merge and learn from that and try to have uh, the best from both wor worlds. For example, uh, as I said, student engagement and uh, encouragement for independent learning uh, are prerequisites for deep approach to learning. So it, uh, for me, um, it can be done in um, in um, um, uh, education 4.0 even when you have a bigger group of students because you can perform with flip, flip classroom with the use of technology with um, work based learning when you when you have tools because sometimes when you have 300 students um, in one big classroom uh, just imagine how it would be to to work in groups but if you combine it with um, uh, online tools, you can re redesign it. And also you can redesign your assessment. You can redesign your feedback. Uh, for example, now we have this uh, very short poll with our uh, participants and it was, it was fine and also chat here. And for example, if you have uh, two teachers working with a, with a class online and a class um, uh, at a, on campus, you can have both. Uh, chatting, you can uh, have new ideas coming, engaging with students. Of course, 
it means that we should count on their uh, preparedness to to participate um, in a flipped classroom or some other other forms that um, that um, the, the prerequisites are uh, the students are active because it's not just uh, for teachers. This lect uh, lecture learns uh, that what we learned is for students as well because there is no good lecture without good student, engaged students, interested students. We can be, we can perform, we can engage, but uh, if they are not willing to participate somehow it is difficult to, to have it. So I, I really, uh, really would like to emphasize this, that uh, we should uh, transfer this message to, to students as well. You are also responsible to have a good, good lecture in a small or big group. Well, that's a really, I think, pertinent point. As you were talking, um, a phrase came to mind about shifting from the learner being the audience to the author. And there's nothing preventing them within the broad methodology and even the physical space, if you're thinking of a traditional lecture theater, of the learner taking on their author role, where they themselves are actually part of the, um, the, the co-construction. And I'm conscious I saw a, a comment in the chat box from Monica, who said not all lecturing has to be about performance. So even the concept of performance has many different aspects to it. Um, David or Paul, do you want to pick up Paul? Come, uh, David, sorry, come in. So if you, if you don't mind, Paul, I'll be quick and then you can then jump in. I mean, I think building off Blashenka, I mean, you know, one of the one of the uh, important things I think we've learned about the art of the lecture is that we have to adopt a multitude of tools and practices in order to um, make our learning environments work. Um, I think, you know, many of my colleagues here at Carleton University learned early on that in this, in this pandemic, to have a successful online course, they simply could not just record a video of themselves lecturing and post it online, that they had to develop other types of opportunities for students to engage with the material. So one of the things I think we've learned here in this moment is that, you know, it's okay to decenter ourselves as lecturers and uh, from, from, the, from the lecture to give our students and empower our students to have more self-directed types of experiences and that actually students will be okay in that. And that actually doing that fosters student engagement. It gets them connected into the disciplines and it gets them uh, curious. The, the third thing that I, saw, I wanna say that I think we've learned from this moment in building back better um, is actually just how important compassion and the feeling of welcome matters to in our mm -hmm. classrooms. I know throughout the pandemic, we've been encouraged to be compassionate. This is something that I think is just good pedagogical practice good way to foster learning and a good thing for us to keep as we as we move forward. That's a, a very important point, um, David. And I wonder, you know, pre-pandemic, how compassionate um, and caring our classrooms were. So this is not, I think, just an outcome of the COVID crisis. Um, and also a cold, hard reality, if we want to be honest with ourselves, is there's a high proportion of students, variable according to faculty and discipline, that pre-COVID weren't attending lectures. So when we're talking the traditional lecture, whatever that might mean. So that is a message for us about something happening, um, whether that be the quality of the pedagogy or the, the learning. But that is something that um, I think, you know, has now been brought to the fore if we're going to build back better. But Paul, that has a probably different context for you in your situation, what does that mean, a lecture in your large organisation going forward or by all means come back to the original question? No, I, I, thanks, Mark. I, I think that I really love the question focusing on the art of the lecture and I think the history and the evolution of distance education has a proven track record of actually perfecting the art of designing, producing and delivering well-designed quality experiences to a multitude of students. So from that perspective, COVID didn't catch distance education with their pants down. In contradiction or in, in contrast to higher education institutions, when they moved to emergency remote, remote teaching, there was no time for design. There was no time for an input of a team of experts that could actually assist uh, the lectures or learning technologists. So lectures were left to their own devices, literally, to get the content 
not the, the lecture to students and they reproduce traditional classroom settings using long unproductive Zoom sessions. So there was very little consideration for design and for the importance of considering that not all students have equal and equitable access or equal access to a good bandwidth. So the danger is that these long unproductive Zoom sessions of the lecture on the stage with no audience will become the norm. So in finally, for me, two things stand out that, that we really need to think of the not the lecture, but the learning experience as the end result of a well-designed process where not only the lecturer has the disciplinary knowledge, but that we can involve learning technologists and a whole team of experts. And then the second aspect that I hope we become, become a permanent feature post-academic is that we really consider low bandwidth, asynchronous communication with students to, to really make our access to online learning more equitable. Yes, well, I guess that's very pertinent given we're taking up a fair amount of bandwidth in this kind of video streamed uh, discussion. Perhaps slightly less because we're not using slides. Um, I felt that we couldn't really turn around having a conversation about the lecture and all be reliant on our slides. Um, I'm going to sort of steer us in a slightly um, Direct, a, a direction looking to the future located perhaps in your own institutions, building on the, the question we were just talking about. But because the last question was there about the art of lecturing, I guess what Paul was saying is I think another legacy potentially of COVID is a better understanding about learning design and, and being much more explicit and mindful about the designs we choose. So in that respect, respect it's not just the art, but there's a craft and a science that goes with this as well. It's not like we are just developing this on the fly with our creative flair and innovation. So mindful of those three dimensions, the, the art, but the craft, and then the science that's informing it. I know, Anne-Marie, I posted a link to your team's research report there. I'm wondering what is going on currently in your own institutions and thinking around and what you know at least about doing things differently um, in the context of the way you're doing teaching, whether that's be face-to-face, -face, blended, hybrid, or fully online. I'm going to ask Anne-Marie just to go first because it's just easier to so rather than okay. give you all the, um, the linear sort of approach to, to do this, but I, perhaps someone else can come in second and then we can go from there. But Anne-Marie, I know you've done some work in this space, so I thought I'd give you the chance to go first. Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that the pandemic did was force us to think about teaching, force every teacher to think about teaching. Um, some may have changed their, their pedagogies significantly, others perhaps less so, but it forced everyone, particularly teachers of very large class cohorts, to conceptual, to engage with, with their uh, understanding of teaching, learning and assessment. And I think in particular, because particularly with those really large cohorts, we were all uh, forced to work online on, on within our virtual learning environment. That moved from being what might have been seen as a repository or a filing cabinet for materials and lecture notes to becoming a much more alive, vibrant space um, where teaching and learning was happening, albeit uh, either, either synchronously or asynchronously. And I think the asynchronous element, and I, somebody mentioned it already, um, the asynchronous element of reconceptualizing how to teach the multiple ways in, in, in conveying concepts and ideas um, is something that, I, th I think is very important going forward, even if when students are all back on campus and we do have some face-to-face -face teaching. I think it's crucial for the, uh, for the very, very large class cohorts um, uh, because it, it provides, it has the pot potential to provide an opportunity for those flipped lecture, um, flipped class um, co uh, contexts. And it also has, um, if, if the asynchronous learning is structured independent learning, 
So, so actually the teacher's hand is in there, but they're structuring what the students may be doing independently, either themselves or in smaller groups. You can specifically align that then to uh, either synchronous online or face-to-face learning. Um, and so it's a real alignment and support and scaffolding of learning through good teaching. Now, you can't, you know, transmitting a 50-hour talk at you lecture on, on, onto, a, onto a video is obviously not the way to go. Um, but I do think that, that higher education teachers, have, have, we've been forced into a situation where we have to think about how we teach, what we teach, and how, what, what, how we make those decisions. Um, and, and, and to think about, you know, the possibilities and the opportunities that, that uh, firstly, that the pandemic actually provided us in terms of teaching and learning, but also that, that teaching very large class groups. I mean, I, I, I don't believe a large class group requires you to talk at them. It requires you actually to do the, to not do that, it required you and and to um, something David said earlier uh, uh, around the 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 resource that a large class is. That our stu- a, a really large class contains lots of people who already know a lot about what you're going to talk about, and harnessing that either asynchronously by asking your students to do a piece to camera that you can use then in your VLE or to to come live like this as part of a panel so that you are creating that classroom atmosphere and that that engagement from students. Um, And and I do think there are times as well when, when, like in any classroom at any level, we may need to explicitly teach something or explicitly make the links. And sometimes that might feel like the class is passive, but if people are listening, listening is active. It's when they're not listening that that it's passive. Um, so 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 I I would I would um, I would con- I would just think about that in terms of of how we conceptualize um, student engagement and what is and isn't active learning, and also the multitude of of ways that a that a teacher. Um, can can engage students in a 50 minute session or across uh, a module and um, the different teaching approach and a teaching approach isn't a lecture versus a work workshop their context a teaching approach is is the actions and strategies I think anyway that a teacher uses to enable learning thanks Emery and and at DCU I can report that we actually have a number of new degree programs that it by their design um, are no longer go, well, are going to be building in an online component um, as a formal part that wouldn't have happened perhaps had we not um, had the experience I saw you shake nodding your head there David so I'm going to come to you next and then we can fight over who with the Paul or um who we go to, but one also thing that you triggered me to, Anne-Marie, was uh, I'm old enough to remember this. I don't know how many, someone could help me out with the, the accurate reference, but Charles Crook published a book, if I remember correctly, Computers and Collaborative Learning in 2005. And one of the introductory chapters points out that when someone is lecturing, there is a conversation going on in the mind between every learner and the lecturer. Um, when I'm saying lecturing here, that doesn't mean in a lecture hall necessarily, because the physical environment might um, be very different. But David, give us an insight into what impact the thinking is having in your institution and your work. Yeah, no, thanks, Mark. And I mean, just to simply, you know, back up uh, a lot of what Emery was saying. I mean, I think absolutely spot on about using the u- using these spaces uh, and using multitudes of different types of approaches. And I mean, just reflecting on my own research and experience within large class teaching, I always adopted what I called the 15 minute rule. And that was every 15 minutes change my sort of pedagogical strategy, uh, not the content, but the, the approach in order to try and keep that attention span. So even if there were moments where I was, you know, just giving that didactic talk at lecture, I knew that they were listening because I knew that their attention spans would last for at max 15 minutes and I would shift and then it would restart, right? And I would I would uh, bring them back 
bring them back in. But what are we doing at Carleton? I mean, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to consolidate some of the uh, gains that we've seen in terms of people thinking about different types of approaches. Um, Anne-Marie mentioned things like the flipped classroom. I think we're going to see a lot more of that take place even at my home institution. The challenge will be is making meaning out of flipped, right? So actually, what will we then do with our face-to-face -face components? Because now if we're going to sort of de-emphasize the traditional lecture as the moment where we all come together physically, what are we going to do with that instead? And fortunately, you know, again, when we come back to thinking about my previous provocation about how are we going to uh, model the way, what types of supports and incentives structures are we putting in place? Well, we're putting it together all sorts of training. We are uh, incentivizing a students as partners program so that uh, faculty members can actually involve students in their course design, which then hopefully brings about, we're trying in explicit ways to bring about more student engagement and student-centered type strategies for those meaningful face-to-face -face interactions. But I will say, you know, we're also thinking about design of our physical spaces differently. Um, again, like the way we structure our classrooms, if you imagine a traditional classroom, fixed seating, pointed forward, you know, stadium style with the, for the large classes, which makes it hard then to engage and interact with people around you. Uh, we're rethinking all that. And our new buildings that we're, we're imagining or that are currently being built, we're actually rethinking some of those, the, the physical design in order to take advantage of bringing people together in meaningful ways, as opposed to reinforcing that face forward, listen passively engage, uh, and minimal engagement. Thank you, Dave. What about University of Zagreb? What, what's happening in your area or beyond um, in terms of rethinking how pedagogy might be done? Yeah, um, it is quite diverse because University of Zagreb is a big one with 75,000 students. So it means that uh, there are uh, really wonderful um, examples of innovative teachers, but at the same time, um, there are others, and I'm really sad about it, but it should be said they are just waiting to pandemics to stop and to go back to their classrooms and their old way of doing things. And I'm really afraid of that. I, I know that it's not um, uh, probably one third of teachers are like that, but sometimes they are very loud. They just said, okay, it is a temporary, let us... Uh, let us um, uh, pass and then we will be back and everything will be um, uh, good again as it was. So I hope it wasn't. Um, uh, so it, uh, I hope it wouldn't be like it was because it is, um, uh, if you look at the, what we have right now, it is like big laboratory. We can, uh, even though we are online, we can uh, really have uh, different approaches, actions, designs, and everything is open. So it's like uh, real, uh, real research laboratories. Because um, just imagine if you would like to have some kind of action research in education and all sorts of uh, committees, all sorts of permissions, all sorts of curriculum uh, approval should be done. But now you are really a teacher. You, you can, you can um, design you can um, evaluate, of course, co-create with your students, with your colleagues, and, um, and really think about um, students in a different manner. Because, you know, when we were in a classroom, even though there are uh, 200 students, you can see some of the faces and you can, you can judge by their expressions if the students are um, catching the concept, working, making notes or uh, answering your questions. Online is a little bit different, but at the same time, just just think about the student who is visually impaired in the last row in a in a in a classroom, and now they're very close. So even though we are talking a lot about um, physical distances, it, it's physical distancing, but at the same time, it can be uh, social proximity because. Uh, I know that some students that uh, were very shy when they were uh, in a physical environment, they can chat, they can participate, working groups, and we can organize all, all sorts of things that engage them. Of course, as David said, uh, it is not easy. Uh, after a while, you can see that they are tired of online environment, they are tired of certain method, they are tired of... Uh, flipped classroom because they don't have time to perform everything. So you should be 
uh, really aware of uh, not students, but the student. And um, I hope that we are doing a great job, at least at my faculty, because we are uh, really keen on having um, all sorts of uh, innovative practices on board. But um, uh, I'm really looking forward on modeling our, let's say, hybrid approach when we are fortunately uh, in an autumn back at, at campus, but not to force our students to be here, but to prepare to be uh, to have a flexible environment, to have uh, accessible, um, not just physical, but also uh, online tools. And because, as I said, we, we learned so much and uh, so we, we, we should use it, but use it in a um, structured, orga uh, organized way. Paul, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm wondering, Paul, here, you've got perhaps the reverse challenge is in the world's oldest distance provider. Many of us will be familiar with ideas such as cognitive presence and how um, it doesn't really matter where you are in the sense of presence, presence you may have. But one of my observations in the COVID era is all of a sudden synchronous delivery became very, very much the norm for a new model of sort of online distance delivery. Some of us scratched our heads because this was never really a big part of distance education. So is there anything that's going to be a legacy in the way in which teaching is done that's going to come out of the COVID crisis for your institution? Thanks, Mark. Uh, I think you pointed to it. I think uh, what surprised me is that the long and history of theorization in distance education, that face-to-face -face and residential education has never took uh, notice of the theory, the community of inquiry framework, or uh, the pedagogies of care and em empathy of Holmberg and the others. So I do think there's a rich theoretical basis for residential institutions to actually go and look at. The thing that I think that changed in, in our institution was the issue was not the lecture. It was there. It was well designed. It was well produced. It was delivered. What we realized, the fact that it was delivered didn't, make, um, didn't mean that learning was taking place. Not all students had access to the lecture. And then the, uh, the last thing from my side is that we realized that good teaching in, in remote learning uh, context means that you have administrative and a support structures that support the lecture. Lectures were found and, and were left carrying the whole weight of teaching without the support of ICT, without the support of administration, without the support of finance department. So teaching can only happen uh, remotely if lectures have the support from the, the other departments. I think that's a crucial lesson we've learned. Well, folks, uh, I just took a glance at the time and I haven't been doing a great job moderating because I should have been telling you to put more of those questions in the Q&A or in the chat box. But I hope like many of you, I've been just fascinated hearing the, the conversation and the different interpretations here. So. Um, the panel almost predictably has probably only scratched the surface of the questions we had that we thought we might explore, but I'm going to just with an eye on the time uh, and conscious we all have busy lives, to ask the panel just to perhaps share a, a couple of thoughts, because I'm very conscious that we've talked, you know, a lot of theory, we've talked about the ideas, but let's concretize this for a minute. In a practical sense, Perhaps you could just take no more than a minute each to share one or two tips or advice, pieces of advice that you might offer for us going forward, thinking about teaching, and I'll use the word here, borrowing from Anne-Marie's um, research, teaching large classes, shall we say, rather than let's get away from that word, the lecture. So Anne-Marie, since I mentioned you and I've given you the first chance each time, I'm going to leave you at the end. So okay. <laughs> um, let's kind of work in reverse order, shall we, from what we've been working on. So Paul, I'm going to come back to you first and then we'll go along the gallery on my view. Okay, uh, some practical issues. Rethink physical presence. Rethink time. Rethink the lecture as a solitary performance to a design learning experience, not the lectures. 
learning experiences that make the optimum use of physical presence, asynchronous and low bandwidth experiences and activities. Rethink time. Thank you very much. I should add that I've just seen from one of my colleagues, Monica, saying we should just keep going, but I am very conscious of uh, the commitment of our panel and they've got busy lives. I know David's got a whole day ahead of him, so we might spill out over more than just right on the hour, but folks, we won't go for too much longer. So David, um, speaking of you, I think you're next up. Thanks, thanks, Mark, and and fully fully agree with Paul's points there about rethinking. Um, where I would I would also uh, encourage rethinking is uh, is this idea of uh, partnership, uh, rethinking the space uh, that students play in our classrooms, and you know engage with the uh, with the notion uh, that students are partners or co creators are uh, invested and un and have already deep understandings of our uh, disciplinary uh, spaces, to bring them in to the classroom in really uh, thoughtful and legitimate ways and, and to look at them as, part, as partners in that process. The other bit too that I would, I would encourage a rethink is around the space and place of disciplinary content. We think that we got in, particularly in large classes, uh, we have to pack in a set curriculum, a set, a set of information that has to be delivered. Um, I think we have to really challenge that idea and put more emphasis on student engagement uh, and ways and means to get our students connected into our disciplines. Because when they get connected into those disciplines, they'll go off and figure out and learn that information by themselves. We don't need to just give it to them on a silver platter all the time. So rethink partnership, rethink content. Yeah, the place and space really resonated with me because I think if we do ask many of our learners, campus-based learners perhaps, but equally it could apply to online, where do they really do their learning? I suspect, and I don't have the evidence to back this up, opinion, that they would say they do a lot of it in their informal spaces, um, the places that are just as important for their learning. So um, thank you for those uh, words of wisdom, if you like. Moving on, then, do we have, um, I'm wondering, is there any, where in your previous ministerial role, uh, it must have been rather challenging, or is there advice that you would have for your current minister or for institutions in Croatia of what they do going back in a practical way? Yeah, but it, it was uh, really enjoyable to go back. And um, even though it was, um, just to mention, a very good experience be, um, in the last, uh, sorry, I was a minister a year ago, also when the pandemic started. And um, it was really enjoyable because um, Croatia was at that time um, um, actually chairing the EU. And so I chaired the um, uh, colleague ministers of education. And for the first time, I really experienced that um, we all uh, like to learn from each other. So it was unique experience because, you know, if there are some other controversial topics, there are always, you know, certain countries or uh, personalities would like to have um, uh, upper foot. But at the, uh, when the pandemic started and when we uh, tried to, to find good practices about how to deliver quality, even, um, even in pand pandemic style in education, it was um, uh, it was really a good experience. So this co-creating and learning from each other was um, was possible among politicians. So I, I I know that it would work among teachers and students. So I really appreciate that Paul and David said about the co-creation. Because we know that we teachers uh, are at the end of the day responsible for the certain results. So we couldn't avoid that. So uh, as Anne-Marie said, that should be, I'm a mathematician, it should be 15 minutes um, time slot when I uh, explain the concept of, I don't know, derivative or something like that. So we couldn't avoid it, but we should, uh, we should be aware of what we are doing and why we are doing. And what I really prefer that uh, after each lecture to have just uh, two or three points what you observed during your lecture, because it helps you later when you go back, when you go back and prepare this, uh, the, next, uh, the next session or material or so on. So just keep uh, uh, having this, keep um, writing the diary of your 
uh, or your teaching and also what you learned so far. And um, uh, create uh, your own preferable hybrid model to suit your style, uh, students um, um, uh, you, you have in front of you and video in your classroom, uh, learning outcomes and be aware of students' needs. So this preparation of your own toolbox with favorite tools, with notes, um, it, it, it really helps. But it is on, on, on a, it is autonomy of teacher in a full, full, full respect and capacity. So in some respects, variety is the spice of life in that there is no such thing as one of the takeaways of the lecture because there are so many twists and creative ways that can be interpreted. So Anne-Marie, I'm going to come to you at the end before I maybe make my own observation if I have the time, but the floor is yours. Okay, well, in terms of practical ideas, I suppose I'm just going to draw on my own experience. Um, I suppose the first thing, what completely changed many years ago, my approach to teaching large classes was I stopped saying I can't do that because the class is too big. I stopped using that phrase and instead I started saying, how can I do that in a large class? What do I need to, how do I, how can I adapt, adapt that strategy? So I think that just that way of thinking in terms of large classes is important. I think from our learning in the last 15 months, the role of the 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 virtual learning environment, Moodle, uh, Blackboard, or whatever you're using, for me has not, is now an extension of my classroom. Even if we go back face to face, and and in order for that to be the case, that will mean that really you really have to design your asynchronous teaching and learning tasks in an aligned way and in a supportive way that supports that teaching supports learning there but also that it carries back into whether it's synchronous or face-to-face -face classes um, when you're working with, uh, with students in, in, a, in a live um, class. I think provision of choice both in terms of how you teach so, so teaching um, you know content in multiple ways can only be, be enhanced by um, better attention to the virtual learning environment, as well as how you present in, in, in the live lecture, be it online or face-to-face. -face. And that choice, I think, needs to be extended to assessment. And it's particularly with large class groups, with all groups, but with large class groups in particular, because they're large, you have a huge resource there of potential assessment outputs from students, some of which might be shared with the, the whole class cohort or with other groups of students. You have a huge pool of talent to draw on there. And I think that talent is potentially um, grown if you allow them choices in what to focus on uh, for an assessment, who to work with, how many people to work with, all the layers of a task uh, if they are, if, if by provide, providing that choice, you are addressing the, the the necessary diversity in a really large cohort like that. Reach out to colleagues and ask them to a co-teach with you, and by co-teach I mean actually be in the room with you, either asynchronously or live, and co-teach. Bring your differing perspectives in so that you can model the different perspectives that arise in every discipline. Um, and uh, also um, co-teaching could be um, more around a community of practice. And I, I've done this before with, with a, a, a CPD module we did in TCU a few years ago where, where we use peer observation. I learned so much by watching somebody else teaching and I learned so much about my own class by having somebody else in the room watching me because they saw so much that I could never see in a class of 400 they were they could um so i i think they're i think they're the big things and i think i think the teaching presence um live face to face and asynchronously is really important like pushing yourself into those two spaces and literally or figuratively moving in those spaces and sharing your proximity with your students and bringing students in to deliver or to contribute to or to share their experiences of particular elements of what you're teaching 
will only enhance um, the, uh, the students' understanding and motivation and engagement. So they're my they're my main takeaways. Well, thanks. Um, thanks to all the panel. I, I've just got three things, if you like, to bring us to a head. We are a little over time, so I've satisfied some, but maybe others have got meetings to rush to. Um, three very quick wrap-ups. The first thing is one of my own tips uh, from a personal experience is asking some students if I was able to look at their lecture notes, what they were writing in terms of what um, they were taking from a lecture that I may have given was really enlightening. Uh, what I thought they might be taking versus what they really were writing down. So that was just a window into the student experience, a very simple thing to do. It's not always an easy thing to ask um, and students, there's a power relationship, but I would encourage you just to, in that spirit of partnership, just see what students are writing down. Are they taking what you think is important? The second, um, I couldn't help, but this is completely unscripted, I couldn't help but in the latter part of our conversation make a connection to the fact that we're all learners as professional educators. And I think there's some pretty important lessons here from COVID and this conversation we've had about the way we go about our learning and perhaps the design of traditional conferences and the way we engage or not. In with um, the traditional keynote, which is in many respects the lecture is personified. So um, I haven't figured out what that really means because I think we're still experimenting with formats for online and hybrid events. But I do think there's a link for the future design of a conference, just like there is for, for the traditional lecture, if you like. And my last point is just simply to thank the panel. Um, came together at relatively short notice. They didn't really know each other beforehand, so we negotiated introductions. And I hope our participants like me have just been really fascinated with their insights from different perspectives, right from very focused on campus delivery in a particular discipline to the world's largest um, um, oldest, sorry, not quite largest, Paul. I better not give you that, that credit yet, uh, you distance university provider. Fascinating conversation. We could go, yes, for another hour, but sometimes it's better to whet the appetite and we might revisit this at some point. I hope folks have found something that they can take away from today's conversation. And I hope that this is the conversation we'll keep having in our own institutions nationally and professionally in our disciplines as we go forward. So thank you very much. Just thanks to the Eden team also for the organization behind the scenes. So have a good evening or for you, David, or anyone else still with a day ahead of them, have a good day. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.